Okay, good afternoon everyone. Craig Kiger with Minnesota DNR Outreach. And today we have a special guest, Sam Gaida. Sam is going to talk about galls, burls, and brooms of northern Minnesota. So welcome everyone. Um, Sam, go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about you. How did you get started in galls, burls, and brooms? Perfect. Thanks, Craig. I appreciate it. And very excited to see everyone here. Uh, great crowd. And so without further ado, I'll dive in. <clears throat> So how did I initially get involved with gulls, burls, brooms, and all of these other weird things growing on plants? It started a couple years ago when I was working up at Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center, one of the naturalists, and I've been really into plants for many, many years. Um, however, as we all know in northern Minnesota, we get quite a bit of snow, and pretty quickly most of the exciting plants disappear in the fall, and then they're gone all winter until the spring. I was really starting to run out of plants to look at. You know, I'd seen a lot of hazel brush and a lot of balsams and a lot more hazel brush and even more balsams and a few spruces. And we were out skiing one day and we were skiing along um, and we started to come across this little river. And all of a sudden as we paused right next to me was this weird little shrub that had a pine cone sticking on the top of it. And I could tell it was a willow and pine cones don't go on willows. And I went, huh. That's really weird. I wonder what that's all about. And so I took some pictures and then we skied away and I promptly forgot about it until that night. And I was looking through photos of the day and decided I was going to try to get to the bottom of this. And I did some internet sleuthing and I pretty quickly found out that it was a gull on a willow caused by a willow pine cone gull midge. I thought, wow, that's a crazy name. That's also super cool because I've seen gulls before growing up on a farm. You know, I'd seen the ones that looked like a ping pong ball and goldenrod and I coming open with my dad and grandpa. I thought, wow, I didn't know they were on other plants. That's pretty wild. And then I forgot about it again. A couple of days later, we were doing some snow measurements on the driveway and I crossed another willow and there was a different shaped lump on one of the buds. And I went, oh, that looks like another gull. And I flipped it and looked around and it had a little hole drilled in the side. And so I picked it and brought it to the house and this one was a little harder to figure out um, because it was a little bit less commonly seen. But after poking and prodding and you know trying to get the keywords right, it turned out it was another gull for sure called a willow beaked gull midge. And at that point, I found two within a couple of days and I was really hooked. And that little accidental stumbling across uh, has really opened up this wild, huge world of tiny things of gulls, burls, and brooms. And so to give everyone a little bit of a roadmap on where we're going today, we're going to look at what is a gull, what is a burl, what is a broom, what is a non-mazone plant diseases, and then after that, where you can find them, how you identify them once you find them, and then we'll look at some of the most common ones that people see here in northern Minnesota, and finally we'll have some follow-up resources for everyone who's interested uh, to continue their journey into gulls, burls, and brooms. So what is a gull? A gull, are, a gull or gulls are abnormal plant growths um, caused by various parasites. I'm going to refer to them for the rest of the presentation, often as inducers or a gull inducer. And they act very similar to a cyst, but on a plant. These gull inducers can be caused by viruses or fungus. However, most often gulls are caused by an insect. Gull, including, gull inducing insects include wasps, midges, aphids, sawflies, silids, mites, flies, moths, and many, many, many other insects. So it's a very wild and diverse group of inducers. So what causes a gull other than an insect? The inducer lays its eggs inside the host plant. The larva then hatches and lives within the growth of the plant, created, creating this tiny little home within the plant by feeding on it. They also release chemicals into the plant that mimic plant growth hormones and help to modify the surrounding plant tissue and create a suitable place for the larva to live and feed upon. These galls can be found virtually on any part of any plant. Um, you'll most often see them on leaves, but you can also find them on the buds, the branches, the stems, and there are even root galls. So why would an insect want to live within a plant? Why would they want to cause a gull? Living within a gull has to offer some sort of significant advantage if so many species have experienced convergent evolution to induce them. 
The benefits from living within a gull are that it's a relatively safe, climate-controlled microhabitat with abundant food to develop within. <clears throat> These hidden chambers and the tough plant fibers protect the insect larva from most of the predators out there. It also provides them with a readily abundant food source. Additionally, it provides a very humid environment within the plant, helping protect these delicate larvae from drying out or from big changes in the outside weather. Now moving into what a burl is. Burls are these hard, woody, gull-like structures on trees. They're pretty similar to benign tumors. Some of them are caused by injuries. Others are caused by bacteria or viruses. However, many times it's impossible to know what caused them to start growing. A great example can be seen on the slide here, where we've got these big burls on a spruce tree on the North Shore. They're pretty common to see near wet areas on the North Shore. However, we don't know what causes them. We suspect it's a type of bacteria, but what initially, similar to a pearl being formed, caused the little growth to start on the tree, dies off pretty quickly, and is gone almost immediately after it starts. However, similar again to a pearl, each year the tree grows another ring around it and another ring and another ring, getting knottier and funkier and weirder. And eventually all of these things build up to create this huge burl on the tree. Burls are pretty famous within the woodworking world because they've got super wild and unpredictable grain patterns. These unusual patterns make them particularly attractive to woodworkers, uh, especially those that turn bowls or do a lot of cabinetry. However, like I mentioned earlier, we don't really know what causes them, and they're also pretty rare, and so they're impossible to farm. This makes many of them, especially the large ones, quite valuable, some of them selling for thousands of dollars. There is a little bit of stewardship related to burls when you find them, uh, and that's because sadly they're so valuable that burls are occasionally poached off of public land. Doing so is illegal and it's devastating to the host tree. These burls are often hacked off the trunk, and because the, especially the large burls are so heavily integrated into the trunk of the tree, removing them unfortunately kills the tree. So if you are a woodworker or you're interested in getting into turning, make sure you purchase your, bull, your burls from a reputable source, or, you know, especially ones that are harvested off of private land or as uh, waste byproducts from logging or neighborhood tree removal. Next up, what is a broom? Which is broom, or brooms for short, are woody gall adjacent growths that often look like someone stuck a small or occasionally large broom within the plant. They're often caused by a fungus or a plasmid or a gall mite, and they're just a big proliferation of branches and twigs all in this mass. People will occasionally mistake them for a squirrel nest or something like that as they're hiking through the forest. Second to last within this group of galls, burls, and brooms are the non-metazoan plant diseases. Non-metazoan plant diseases are just a fancy way of saying non-insect caused plant disease. Uh, the most common examples, such as the very top photo here, are funguses, especially rust, which have these bright rusty orange spores that appear on the plant. You can also have bacteria, such as the bottom right, um, in which we've got a bacteria infecting a uh, Canadian thistle. And you can even have viral infections, such as the one in the bottom left on this paper birch. Similar to how squares and rectangles are related, this means that some gulls, burls, and brooms are non-metazoan plant diseases. However, not all gulls, burls, and brooms are non-metazoan plant diseases. There are a few gull-adjacent critters I'd like to touch on quickly, though they will not be the focus of this presentation. Uh, the first one is our scale insects. These are small insects that are essentially the barnacles of the aphid world. Uh, you can see a photo on the upper right there. When they mature, they attach themselves to a host plant and they permanently stay there affixed to the plant, feeding on its sap while they're being protected by uh, their hard exoskeleton. When you also get into looking for gulls, burls, and brooms, you'll really start to notice that there's an entire other world of leaf miners out there. Leaf miners are flies and moths, which feed on the leaf in between the upper and the lower epidermis. They mine out all of the leaf material and leave behind piles of frasses in the middle. So now we've gone over gulls, burls, brooms, and non-mesozoan plant diseases. And that brings up the question, where do you find them? They're everywhere. 
You just have to, similar to looking for agates, learn to have your brain recognize them. When you first start getting into agates, you'll be walking down, you know, a dirt road or a gravel pit, and someone who's already in the know will see them. Often they'll see them exactly where you walked, and you're like, how did I never see that? I can't believe that I missed it. However, as your brain gets better and better at recognizing these patterns, pretty quickly you'll start to pick up on it faster and faster and faster, and soon you'll be able to notice that they're there without actively looking for them. The same thing is going to happen with gulls, pearls, and brooms. And after this presentation, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on who you're walking with, you'll never be able to go for a hike in the woods without noticing them ever again. So once you find a gull, burl, or broom, how do you ID them? The first step in learning to identify your gall, burl, or broom is looking at the host organism. Gall-inducing organisms are super host-specific, and they're normally only found on one species or occasionally one closely related genus of plants. Great example is this one down here. If we get really close into the plant, we'll start to get a little bit more. We'll look at the buds, the leaves, and everything, and this is a sugar maple. Once we've ID'd the plant, we want to look at the exact location of the gull on the host plant. That's because in addition to being host specific, gull inducing organisms are incredibly picky about where they cause their gulls to form. They generally lay their eggs and live in only one part of the plant. This could be the terminal bud, the underside of the leaf mid vein, an internode or the roots specifically. The example that we're looking at here is this gull has chosen the very top side of the sugar maple leaf to cause its gull to grow on. So now that we found a gull, we know what plant it's on, we know what part of the plant it's on, the next step is trying to learn what type of organism might be inducing the gull. And so deciding what sort of organism might be inside uh, can be done very sleuthily by looking at the clues present on and in the gull. The first group I'd like to dive into are the gull midges. Gull midges are incredibly diverse. It's wild just how many gull midges there are in northern Minnesota. Being they're so diverse, also the gulls that they form are even more diverse. And the gull midges can form either single or multi-chambered gulls with varying numbers of larvae in them. Sometimes there's one larva, sometimes there's 15 or 20 all in one chamber or you know, dispersed around a multi-chambered gull. These larvae are almost always bright, bright orange. There are a few exceptions like everything in nature and the couple that aren't strikingly bright orange happen to be pale yellow. In addition to this, after they reach their third instar or third growth stage, the gull midges chew their way out of the gull and they pupate in the soil. So that happens that if you often come across a gull uh, in the late summer or early fall and you crack it open, there might be a good chance that there's nothing in it because the gull midge has already left. Most plants in Minnesota, especially prairie plants, have at least one but often more species of gull midges on them. The next group of gull inducing organisms I'm going to touch on are the gull wasps. Gull wasps generally form multi-chamber gulls that have small white larvae in them. The larvae normally overwinter in these gulls, emerging in the spring. And so that means you'll often find old wasp gulls that have many small exit holes bored in the side of them. A special subsect of the gull wasps are the oak gull wasps. Um, these oak gull wasps are really interesting because they have an incredibly diverse family, but they only form gulls on oak trees. They also often have a wildly complicated life cycle with multiple different generations each year, one being sexual, one being asexual, and each of those form different gulls. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, one or both of these species often have an undescribed life stage that we don't know what the other gull from the second life stage is. There are over 800 species of oak gull wasps in North America, and there are more being described every year. And so if you look into this, especially with their sexual and asexual lifestyle, that means there are close to 1600 oak gull wasps found on oaks 
in North America. So if you come across a gull on an oak tree, there's a very good chance it's caused by an oak gull wasp. The next group are the gull flies. Gull flies generally form very large single celled gulls with a single large white larva in the center. The most famous that almost everyone have, has seen is found on goldenrod and it forms those ping pong ball sized gulls in the middle of the stem. And if you crack them open uh, summer until late winter, you'll find a larva inside that many people like to use for fishing. <clears throat> Another very diverse group of gull inducers are the gull mites. Um, they cause a very wide variety of different gulls depending on which family or genus they're within. The most common form of gulls caused by the mites are patches of erinium or velvet, woolly, bright colored, often pink or orange velvet on the top of the leaf. They also cause bead pouch gulls or spindles, which look like little fingers coming off the top of a leaf, but the, occasionally there are some species that form small bud brooms coming off of the end of a twig. Aphids also form gulls and gulls induced by aphids form these hollow balloon like brittle walled gulls filled with a large colony of aphids. Often on the inside, there's extra wool and waxy secretions. You can see a really nice example on the bottom left there. It's thought that these waxy secretions are uh, put off by the aphids to not only help stabilize the temperature a little bit, but also to help modify the humidity. It collects a lot of extra moisture from within the gall and the plant, and it keeps it a very stable, humid environment for the aphids to live within. Every once in a while, when you're looking at gulls, you'll also run into a pseudo gull, such as the one on the bottom right, which is called a leaf curl aphid. They have these very distinctive curled leaves that get a little bit bunchier on either side of the ribs, causing it to, or sorry, either side of the veins, causing it to look like a rib up and down the leaf. We also have fungi. Fungi galls are normally caused by rust, though they can be caused by other fungi, and rust have very bright orange spores. Uh, they can cause some burls, they can cause brooms. Um, but most often you'll end up seeing rust fungi as these little patches of bright orange or yellow spots. And then on the top or bottom side of the leaf that has these spots, there are dusty orange spores on it. There are a few species that create large pockets on the leaves or fruit, which are hollow and empty. And when you crack them open, you can't see any sign of an inducer within them. Lastly, I wanted to touch a little bit on a few miscellaneous gull inducing organisms that you're likely to come across in the field. On the bottom left, we have a moth gull. Moths form large oblong elliptical stem gulls that have exit holes in the side. If the moth larvae is still inside, the little caterpillar, they form little trap doors that they put in front of those holes where they board their way in. And they make the trap door out of frass, which is insect poop, their silk and little bits of the gull around them that they pull off and they stick it there and they lock it closed. When they're ready to leave, they pull that trap door open and worm their way out. And so if you look at one of these moth gulls, especially in the winter, you can tell if there's likely a still larvae inside by seeing if that hole is open or if there's a little trap door in place. We've also got a bunch of native adelgids. These adelgids form spiky pineapple shaped gulls on the spruce buds uh, here in Minnesota. They're particularly common on white spruce, but you can also find them on black spruce. If you live in the southern part of the state where you have hackberries, it's very common to know of hackberry gulls. They're very infamous for having tons of gulls on the leaves. These are caused by the hackberry silids, and they're a very diverse but very uh, easily ideable group of organisms because they only form gulls on hackberries. Lastly, we've got a really interesting one found on aspens or poplars, depending on how you like to name them, which are the Harmondiolia gulls. If you get into gulls, burls, and brooms, you're going to find these little fly gulls on especially quaking aspen. However, really cool, they have very, very, very 
uh, few described species. Most of them are undescribed and unknown species to science. People just haven't found them interesting enough or have had the time or the funding to dive into this genus. And so if you'd like to see an undescribed species here in Minnesota, I really recommend you go out and check out all the quaking aspen leaves you can find because it is guaranteed you'll come across an undescribed species. So now we've looked at gulls. We know how to ID the plant they're on, what part of the plant, and we have a good guess at what type of gull might be caused by an organism within them. So now how do we name them? Getting into common names, the common names are generally created by stringing a bunch of adjectives together. Although not perfect, the names really follow a general format here, where in the beginning, they list your host species, such as maple, oak, basswood, that sort of thing. The next part of the name is either the location of the gull on the host plant, such as the bud, the twig, the leaf, uh, the vein, that sort of thing, or the shape of the gull, such as a tongue or a ball or um, any varying thing that you can decide a gull looks like. The third part of the name is the word gull. And lastly, we have the type of inducer within the name, such as, you know, a gull midge, gull fly, gull wasp, that sort of thing. So as I go through the next couple common names, uh, I'm going to describe them and then there's going to be a picture, and if you'd like to at home, I'd recommend you just try to sketch out what you think the possible name could be using this formula, and we'll see how close everyone gets. First one, we've got a very classic one here. I've already mentioned it really briefly. We've got a willow, and on this willow, there is a pine cone shaped gull found on the bud. It can be found on a bunch of different willows in Minnesota, which is kind of unusual for a gull inducer, but also very cool because it makes it easy to ID. So we've got a willow, we've got a pine cone gull on the bud, and lastly, it's caused by a midge. So if we string all that together, we have a willow, pine cone, gull, midge. <clears throat> Next up, we've got a gull that's pretty commonly seen in the winter in the tops of our ash trees. In northern Minnesota, it really prefers the black ashes, but moving into southern Minnesota, you can also find it on green. And if you hit a place in Minnesota with white ash, you can also find it on white ash. So this is uh, an ash host species. It causes these cauliflower shaped gulls on the flowers of the ash plant. It is a gull. And lastly, it's caused by a tiny little microscopic mite. So if we put all that together, we have a ash, flower, gull, mite. As wonderful as this raw format is, especially helping you try to figure out what, you know, to search for within a common name, it's not always perfect. Here we have a white oak, and on the white oak, on the underside of the mid vein, we have this big spiky cluster of a gull. Someone at one point decided that it looks like a rolled up hedgehog. So we're gonna call it a hedgehog. So on our white oak, we have a lower mid vein uh, hedgehog and it's caused by a gull wasp. So if we use our not perfect formula, we're gonna end up with a white oak, hedgehog, gull wasp. However, because it's not perfect, uh, we don't include the white oak in this common name, and it's just the hedgehog gull wasp. The formula also roughly works for burls and brooms as well. And so here we have one of the most common brooms you'll find, especially in the northern part of the state, on a balsam fir. On the balsam fir, we've got this big broom, and it's caused by a rust fungus. And so if we put all those parts together, we have our fir, broom, we get rid of a gull because it's not a gull, it's a broom, rust fungus. And so if you're hiking in the northern part of the state and you come across this big cluster of twigs on a balsam fir, it's almost guaranteed to be a fir broom rust fungus. This process of stringing all these adjectives together to describe the common name of a gull can lead to some really funky and really funny names. This one happens to be my favorite common name of any species I've ever come across due to the pure absurdity of its length. 
it really sounds like you've just made it up and you're just really spitballing as you're going. And the insect, if you look at your pinky finger is, sorry, the um, fungus is maybe as long as from the tip of your cuticle all the way back to the nail bed. That's as long as this fungus causes uh, the gall to grow. And this is found in the Eastern United States only on an alder and it's caused by a leaf curl fungus. <clears throat> it's also thought that it looks kind of like a tongue and it's found on the pseudo cones of the alder. And so if we put that together, we have the Eastern American alder tongue gull fungus gull. Challenge you to try to say that five times fast. Such a fun, such a funky name for such a tiny little organism. So now we've touched on galls, burls, brooms, non meso and plant diseases, and we've got a general format for learning to ID them and trying to figure out a little bit more about what they are and a general idea of how to give them a common name. I'm next going to dive into some of the most common galls found here in Minnesota. So getting into our most common galls, uh, one of my favorite is the black knot. This causes a big black mass to grow on cherries or anything within the prunus genus. So most commonly it's seen on choke cherries, but you can also see it on black cherries, fire cherries, um, plums, that sort of thing. <clears throat> Some people like to call it the raccoon poop fungus because it looks kind of like a big turd that's been stuck there. Um, and normally it is pretty detrimental to the plant that it's on, which is unusual because most gulls, burls, and brooms are considered just barely parasitic because if you end up hurting your host plant, it really is not in your favor. And so the vast majority of galls are considered pretty benign to the plants that they're on. Every once in a while, you will see, instead of these little fungal growths on a branch, on a black cherry, a really big stem burl caused by black knot fungus, though that one's pretty unusual. The next up is a very classic one that almost everyone here in Minnesota has seen at some point or another. And especially when you're hanging out with kids, they're very likely to have cracked one open. That is the goldenrod gull fly. And this was the first gull that I ever came across myself as a small child. They look like a ping pong ball stuck in the middle of a goldenrod stem and they persist all winter. And so it's pretty common to find them midwinter on the very remains of a goldenrod that has no leaves on it, but it does have this stem gall in the middle. If you crack it open, as you can see on the left side here, if you look really closely in uh, the left half of that gall, inside is a little, uh, I guess, fairly large white larvae. Lots of people have cracked them open and used them as fishing bait. They're also really fun to watch in the winter because lots of birds have found them as a great source of protein. These insects live in the gall all year, and they actually secrete incredibly high amounts of sugar into their bodies right before winter to act as an antifreeze. And because they're alive and they're a great protein source with lots of sugar in them, birds absolutely love them, especially chickadees and nuthatches, um, but also downy and hairy woodpeckers. And so if you wander around and you look at all these goldenrod gull fly galls, especially in winter, you'll often find these holes where birds have pecked their way through to find a live insect larva in the winter and eat them. <clears throat> uh, one of the other very common brooms found in Northern Minnesota is called black leaf. And it's called black leaf because it causes the leaves to go black on uh, the June berries. You can also refer to the genus as service berries or Saskatoons, whichever you prefer. It infects all of our different June berry species in northern Minnesota. And in addition to causing these leaves to have this black velvety underside to them, they also form these brooms within the plant that hold on to their leaves super late in the winter. So if you're hiking around, especially on the North Shore in the winter, and you see this cluster of dark black leaves hanging on a tree, it's going to be the black leaf fungus. <clears throat> the first midge I'd like to touch on um, is the oak leaf gull midge. This is one of the very few non-oak gull wasp gulls found on the oaks. It particularly prefers northern red oak and northern pin oak here in Minnesota. 
um, and it causes these little wart-like galls to come off of the top of the oak leaf. If you find them early summer to midsummer, I'd recommend grabbing one. You have to peel it off the leaf. It doesn't like to come off, but if you crack it open on the inside, you'll find a bright orange larva, which is really exciting because not only have you found one of the gall inducers within its host plant, but it also helps to show you just how strikingly orange a lot of these larvae are. Getting into the fall, as the leaf gets really wet and the gall starts to break down, it often gets this dried paint uh, peeling off the wall or like old mud curling up in a mud puddle shape with the outside texture of the gall as well. Uh, one of the more wild looking uh, brooms slash gulls slash burls found uh, often in people's yards is caused by the juniper apple rust fungus. Normally it causes these golf brown funky golf ball looking galls on our junipers which includes the eastern red cedar which has a very misleading name. Most of the year they look like these golf balls however one or two days in early spring when the temperature and humidity just perfect all of these bright orange tendril octopus looking arms all of a sudden sprout out of the gull. These are all filled full of spores and they're blown away by the wind and they travel sometimes 10, 15, 20 miles away. And rusts are pretty weird because to complete their life cycle, they have to have multiple different hosts. And most of the time these hosts not only don't live in the same type of habitat as each other, but they're not even in the same genus or family or even order. And this is a great example of that because not only does it cause the gulls on junipers, but it also causes bright orange leaf spots on apples. And so this spore has traveled 15, maybe 20 miles and find a dew drop that it has to land in by luck on an apple leaf before it dries up. And if it does that, then it is able to continue its life cycle and cause a leaf spot where it then grows little tendrils later in the fall, releases the spores which travel back to your cedar and, sorry, not a cedar, a juniper and cause a gull on juniper. Coming back to the hackberries, we have the most common and easy to find gull on the hackberry and that's the hackberry nipple gull silid. These are often so numerous in numbers on the bottom side of the hackberry leaf that they cause the leaf to start to curl and turn and deform a little bit. They're also pretty big and so when you cut them open it's really easy to find the little silid which is kind of like a like plant louse living inside them. Often in the fall or early spring they also hatch out and so many people have seen these little insects flying around and they've not known that it came from the hackberry tree they have planted outside their front door. <clears throat> not particularly a gull but gull adjacent that is really common for people to find during deer hunting season are the woolly alder aphids. Woolly alder aphids are kind of fun because they're kind of like the little sheep of the aphid world. They start off on the tag alders around the swamp or swamp alders, depending on what you'd like to call them. And they're kind of waxy looking and bumpy and they're not the most exciting. But as they get older, they grow these huge tendrils of fuzz coming off of them that they like to all in motion sway together to make the whole plant look like it's moving and crawling. And it's really exciting and very fun to find. If you happen to be lucky enough to find them earlier in the fall or late summer. They're a favorite for late summer uh, wasps that are looking for a source of protein to come and pick off the little larva, bring them away and eat them. If it's a particularly good colony close to a very hungry wasp nest and you sit there for a couple hours, you can watch the entire colony of aphids be picked off and whizzed away to be fed to all the new larvae of the wasp. Moving back to oaks, um, this one causes really intense gulls on especially young burr oaks that persist for years after the insect lives in them. They're called the oak rough bullet gull wasp. And they form these pointy gulls that start early in the year as green with a 
brownish fuzzy tip on the end that age to dark brown um, on the plant. These ones have a really cool evolutionary uh, adaptation as well. And at the very end of that brown tip, when they're still larvae inside, they secrete honeydew and sweet stuff from the plant that they're within. This then attracts ants and other wasps who kind of care for them like they would a colony of aphids. And they fight off all foreign you know, things that you wouldn't particularly want there, such as parasites or uh, something that might eat them. And they protect the larva within these gulls because of the secretions that the ants or wasps are feeding on. It's a really wild form of evolutionary, you know, adapt adaptations. If you think about it, that through trial and error, accidentally, this gull has learned to secrete uh, sweet stuff out of it to have its own bodyguard to protect it. If you're not a fan of buckthorn, like most of us are, uh, this one is a really exciting rust fungus. It's caused by a couple different funguses. We're still trying to figure out exactly what they are and what subspecies are uh, within it, but it's called the crown rust complex. And it really loves to attack buckthorn and it's from uh, the place where buckthorn is native over in Europe. And it alternates in between brome grass and buckthorn most likely. Uh, when you find it early in the spring, it has all of these orange spots all over the leaves. Um, but even more exciting, especially towards Twin Cities, it seems to be getting more and more aggressive and you can find it more often on the flowers of the buckthorn and it stops that plant from flowering and then stops it from producing berries, which is very exciting. I know the U of M is currently researching it right now and seeing uh, what is all going on and trying to figure out the exact species that's causing this. If you find buckthorn later in the year, it often has these telltale target spots in them where it's really white in the center and it gets darker going to the out of it. And those are dead spots caused by this uh, crown rust fungal infection. <clears throat> if you're looking at goldenrod, looking for that goldenrod gull fly, you'll also come across the goldenrod bunch gull midge pretty regularly. Especially in winter when you're looking across the field and you'll just see a few wisps of goldenrod sticking up. Some of them have the ball galls on them and some of them have these clusters of leaves at the top caused by the goldenrod bunch gull midge. It's pretty cool how they uh, cause the gull to form because they tell the plant that it has grown up and it no longer needs to continue growing up. It just needs to put out a new set of leaves because the plant thinks it's tall enough to. This causes it to grow a bunch of leaves in the same area, forming these big clusters of leaves that get smaller and smaller and smaller as they go further up. We also have the American tar spot fungus, which causes these little brain-like black, hard, crispy uh, fungal infections on our uh, maples. It is native. It's considered non-harmless or not harmful to the plant. It is harmless. Um, and they're pretty fun to find, especially in the fall when they start to be more noticeable. This one's got a great name. Um, at least I'd like to think so because this is the common name I've started to call it. And it's the cotton candy oak gull wasp. They normally this kind of pink purple, every once in a while they're like a beige white, but the most exciting ones alternate in between pink purple, beige white, pink purple, beige white. And many of these oak gull wasps uh, produce little specialized fatty production things on the end of their gull. And in the fall, they drop off the leaf before the leaf falls. These fatty things entice ants nearby to pick them up and carry the gull down into their burrow where they eat the little fatty bit and then they throw away the gull that has the larva inside into their garbage pile. The larva has a beautifully warm place to you know, spend the winter to fully mature. And in the spring they hatch out and they crawl their way out of the ant burrow and fly away to find a new oak to start the life cycle all over. That was only discovered a couple years ago, I think two or three, if I remember correctly. And it's a really fascinating evolutionary adaptation as well. Nice big burl that is often found on jack pines is caused by the pine oak rust fungus. Um, every once in a while, if you're looking at the leaves of oaks, especially northern red oak and northern pin oak, 
in late summer, you'll see weird black spirally hairs coming out of it, which are the rust fungal spores after they've started to die. But most likely you're going to come across these large woody burls on jack pines or scotch pines. Most people have also come across the uh, oak apple gall wasps. They're called so because they look like a small apple on an oak leaf, particularly our northern red oak and northern pin oak. There are a couple different species in Minnesota, and the easiest way to ID them is to peel a little bit of the outside of the gull off to look to see what's in the middle. Normally, you'll find it's full of this spongy foam-like material that's brownish, and in the very center of that, if you peel away, you'll find a little chamber with a wasp larva inside. However, every once in a while, you'll find that there are these spindles that come into the center and have this little chamber floating in the center of it, supported by the spindles, instead of being the spongy oak apple gull wasp. That's caused by the larger empty oak apple gull wasp, which also has a great common name because it's so long compared to the size of the insect. We touched on this one a little bit earlier. Um, it's one of the big brooms found in northern Minnesota, and it's the fur fur broom rust fungus because it alternates in between two different furs. Most of the year you'll see these squirrel nest looking clumps within fir trees, and most people would assume they're dead, which is not true. For some reason, this rust causes the host plant to lose its needles. And then in the spring, the host plant grows all of these new growths covered with bright orange spores on the underside, which you can see on the right side here. As these spore, they get released, they find a new uh, balsam fir to start a new uh, broom. And then the brand new, beautifully kind of funky shaped uh, needles that have formed on the burl fall off, disappear, and then they're done until the next spring. <clears throat> this one has got a really cool history in how it became an invasive species in another part of the world. It's got a really hard to say common name with Phyllocera, a little funky with the X in there. And so the grape Phyllocera uh, is an aphid-like thing that feeds both on gulls on the leaf, and then in the winter it moves to the roots and it feeds on the roots. When uh, we started moving things after the Americas were discovered over to Europe, um, turns out none of the European species were ready to deal with this feeding on the roots and it actually decimated the wine crops across Europe, essentially killing every single old uh, vine. To deal with this, they had to take uh, naturally resistant American grape varieties and graft the roots onto the varieties that they wanted to grow for grapes. And so pretty much all of the species of uh, wine producing grapes found in Europe are living on American root grafts because they have these insects that they accidentally brought over and they need to deal with. Getting close to the last couple ones, um, People will often find the Eastern Dwarf Mistletoe causing brooms in black spruce swamps. Uh, if you're a birder and you like to go to the Zaxxon Bog and you spend time looking around, you'll almost definitely see these big clumpy brooms in black spruces as you're driving around the bog. If you happen to get really up close to them, you'll find that they have these cool bright colored little plants sticking out of the infected broom area, uh, which is the dwarf mistletoe itself. They flower early in the spring, and if you have to see that, you're pretty lucky because they're really wet at the time that they do flower. Very special one to me is the thimbleberry gull wasp. It causes these big uh, gulls on thimbleberries on the North Shore. It also has a really great example of people not noticing gulls, burls, and brooms for years, and then all of a sudden, once they know they're there, kind of losing their mind and thinking that, they can't have overlooked this their entire life. On the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, in the 80s, they started to notice that these gull wasps were on thimbleberries that they were starting to try to use for production, for jams and everything. Uh, as they you know, started to look around, people decided that they had to be a non-native introduced from the West Coast. However, genetic analysis has revealed that they are a really interesting, though their own, not quite a subspecies, 
um, group of thimbleberry gull wasps that have been native to the Lake Superior region since the last ice age. If you're in southern Minnesota, you'll often see hickories that are covered in hundreds of burls. Those are caused by the uh, hickory phylomopsis uh, fungus, and they cause all of these little burls. Um, they don't seem to hurt the host tree, but it's very shocking when you do see a tree covered in hundreds of little burls. And lastly, we've got a really interesting combo here of the Carbonifera goldenrod gall midge and the Astromaya gull midge fungus. The gull is actually made out of the fungus itself, and it forms this really hard disc that the midge lives within. The midge gull then hatches and the female gets spores on herself and she flies away to a new plant. When she finds it, she injects her larvae into the plant and also introduces the fungal spores into the plant. The fungus can't spread to the plant otherwise and the fungus then grows this hard protective disc around the midge. The midge feeds on the fungus and they live together happily in this really cool relationship. So now that we've touched a little bit about gulls, burls, and brooms, I really hope you'd like to learn a little bit more about them. And I've got a couple follow-up resources for you. The first one is the Gull Formers website. It's a website founded with uh, by a bunch of people who wanted to have the goal of a free resource to help people learn about gulls because a lot of the literature is paywalled. Uh, these are gonna be posted in the chat and I'd really recommend checking out the Gull Formers website and you, poking around and finding all the information that you can on it, because you can search specific keywords and find what gull it is that you're looking at. Another great uh, format is iNaturalist, which is an app dedicated to helping people learn about the natural world around them by taking pictures and uploading them to a website in which other people ID them. Uh, it can also be used for research purposes. Um, I put together a couple projects, one that I really like to use gathers all the observations of gulls found within Minnesota, which can be found at the Gulls, Burls, and Brooms of Minnesota uh, project on iNaturalist. And if you'd like to see one that's a little bit broader that goes around Lake Superior, you can also look into the Gulls, Burls, and Brooms of the Northwoods data set. Awesome. That is all I have for the initial part of my presentation, and we're about to move into some question and answers. Thank you, Sam. That was very thorough. And uh, we've got <clears throat> quite a few questions coming in already. Alicia wants to know, just wondering if it's illegal to, or if you can reach to grab a broom to start my fire, or does the removal hurt the tree as well? I would say it depends on where the broom is and what land that you're on. Um, you know, if you're on public land, you really want to look into, because uh, it could be a PMA, it could be a WMA, it could be tax forfeited land. You'd have to look into the legislation behind who owns that piece of land and what you're allowed to take off of it. However, you did bring up a great point that especially the fur brooms when they die, because they do die as they get shaded out, um, all the twigs are really fine. They're held up off the ground and they stay very dry underneath the cone of the balsam fir. And so they are an excellent fire starter for all that tiny little kindling that you're looking for. Okay. Uh, we'll have you shut down your PowerPoint so the folks can see the full screen. There you go. Um, our next question, why isn't the gall, why isn't gall the last word in the naming formula? if it's describing the gull and not the insect itself? That's a great question. Um, it's also a little bit redundant because as you look at gulls and like their uh, not perfect common naming system, you will often say something such as, you know, this is the Eastern American alder tongue gull fungus gull. And so you're describing both the insect that causes them or the fungus or whatever induces the gull. And then you're saying it's not only this, thing that induces it, you're then specifying it's the gull on the plant. Um, kind okay. of a funky system. It's not perfect, uh, but it works pretty roughly well for anyone who would like to learn a little bit more about them. So Mary has a question. Could you say more about how the broom fungi create the twigs and other woody bits? 
I'll try to go into a little bit. I don't fully understand it. And I think we're still trying to figure that out as well um, through research. Uh, to the best of my understanding is somehow it mimics plant growth hormones as well. And it causes the plant just almost like a uncontrolled cancer to just start sprouting all of these buds off of it. And these buds then have more buds that sprout off of them. And then they keep sprouting kind of, you know, a river cascade effect until you get all of these uh, branches that are growing every which way that aren't particularly taking signals from the tree. You're taking signals from the fungus about where to grow um, and how quickly to grow and how quickly to split, causing all of this disarray, making the broom. It would be really fascinating to know more exactly, you know, pathways and all of the things that specifically cause a broom to become a broom. Mm -hmm. Do we know how the juniper apple gall inducers evolve their weird life cycle? Not to the best of my knowledge. Maybe someone who has really dove into it does. Um, there are a few very similar ones that go in between uh, like hawthorns and cedars or hawthorns and junipers. Um, and so, you know, there's a chance that a very similar species existed that went, that was the one that went from hawthorn to juniper or hawthorn to cedar. And then it just found that, you know, it could hop over instead of a cedar due to a genetic mutation to a juniper. And then once apples got here, it found out it could also live on an apple since closely related to a hawthorn. And that would be my best guess on how we got that specific species. Um, but I don't know how, you know, rusts ended up going in between such different hosts and it would be really interesting to learn more. Um, but I haven't been able to find more on that myself. Alicia wants to know, does the golden rod bunch gall midge prohibit the pollen body from forming at the end of the season? Going to give you a short answer and then a long answer. Uh, the first answer is yes and no. Um, longer answer is sometimes it does, you know, stop the plant from producing flowers. Um, and they've also found that when it does produce flowers, where it splits off from underneath that gall, the flowers are a little bit less fertile and don't produce as good of seed. Um, however, it doesn't, you know, fully stop the goldenrod from reproducing and its goal isn't to stop the goldenrod from fully reproducing otherwise it would eventually run out of host plants um and so it does seem like it is a little detrimental to most of them but some of them are fine uh and continue to flower anyways okay uh we must be getting close to the lunch break here because alicia wants to know can we eat any of these insect protein mm, that's a great question um, I come across this question more often when I'm teaching about gulls to, uh, like kids, because they're really interested to see what's inside of them. And then they immediately go, oh, oh, birds eat those. Can I eat those? And I haven't particularly eaten many of them. Um, every once in a while, when I don't have a knife with me, I'll crack open, uh, like a goldenrod gull fly and I'll, you know, use my teeth to get into it. Every once in a while, you're unlucky and you bite into it. Um, and I wouldn't say they taste great, but they also don't taste bad. Uh, it'd be interesting to know more. And if you wanted to, you could experiment, uh, but there's a chance that they do concentrate, they could concentrate, you know, bitter plant compounds in them since they are eating the plants. And so my best guess would be most of them taste pretty terrible, but every once in a while you might get lucky and one would be fine. Okay. Um... Are the gull inducers generally abundant enough that you don't have to worry about harming the organism? Or for that matter, do you ever worry about the inadvertently spreading the inducer, particularly in the funguses? Oh, that is a great question. A um, Couple different aspects to it there. Uh, I kind of treat when I find a gull um, it, in a similar vein to as foraging, where if there's only one and you find only one in that area, and even if you're not quite sure what it is, I don't cut it open, I don't rip it apart, I'll maybe take pictures of it, but if it's something really weird, I don't want to cause it to, you know, 
go locally extinct or expatriate it. And so I won't try to do anything with it. Um, most, almost all of the gull inducers in Minnesota are native species um, that are, that have evolved within our ecosystem to infect native species. And so they're not really detrimental to the species they're on, especially when you consider the entire population and how nuanced uh, an environment can get. There are a few interesting examples of non-native gull inducers found in Minnesota. And one of the examples was like the buckthorn rust. Um, there are a few found, generally they're found on pretty invasive plants, thus as, such as thistle. They have a thistle gull fly, which was introduced because it really stops the thistle from flowering and it only affects the Canadian or bull thistle. Um, and so those were purposely introduced to try to slow down and really bring down the population of Canadian thistle, which is pretty cool. So we've got about um, four minutes left and three questions. So we'll try to get them all in. Our, uh, <coughs> excuse me, are gull wasps solitary species or is there a communal aspect to their behaviors as with hive forming species? They seem to be are very, very uh, solitary species that, um, they hatch, they mate, and then they die pretty immediately afterwards. And even in the spring, they're even more solitary because only a female asexual generation will hatch. They'll go lay their eggs and then they'll die almost immediately afterwards. Okay. Um, I've observed, this is from Carol, I've observed berries on my service berry be fuzzy and non-edible. Is this a fungus? Yes, um, that's one of three possible rust fungus. And if you find it at the perfect time of the year, they kind of make them look like a little mace, you know, tons of spiky bits coming off of the young Juneberry or service berry fruit. It's pretty cool that there are three very similar funguses, uh, but you can only tell them apart by looking at the spores underneath the microscope. Uh, so for the general purposes of the day-to-day -day person, they're all roughly the same species. Cool. Uh, and our final question for the day is from Charlie. Can you eat or drink the honeydew from the oak bullet gall? Ooh. Is it sugary? Oh, I've not tried it. Um, I've only a couple times come across some that were actively, you know, excreting liquid and they were covered with ants and there were hundreds of wasps around them. And so I didn't get particularly close enough to even take a good picture of the ants on them, even though I would like to. It would be a great experiment to try because um, I'm sure it'd be very sweet and be fun to figure out. Okay. Well, that uh, concludes our talk on galls, burls, and brooms. Um, tune in next week for episode 140, the emerald ash borer. So we're going to stick with the, uh, the forestry topic here for another week. And... Uh, talk about those. We did the practice session. It was very interesting. So with that, Cassie, I'll have you end the recording and move us back to the practice room. Thank you, everyone.